Of all the wars fought by Americans, it was the one that saw the nation torn apart that had the most significant casualties. We're talking about the American Civil War. According to a 2012 study, approximately 750,000 soldiers died on both sides, about half of them from combat, while the rest died as a result of accidents, starvation, and disease during the first U.S. Civil War. The divisions ran deep. American versus American, brother against brother. One day you're my neighbor, and the next day you're my enemy. No deeper were those divisions than in the border states between the North and the South. Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri. On May 30th, 1854, President Franklin Pierce signed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, allowing popular sovereignty in determining if a territory would be a slave state or a free state. On January 16, 1861, the Missouri General Assembly passed a bill allowing the citizens of Missouri to elect delegates from each senatorial district to a state convention to determine Missouri's status in the Union. At that time, they voted to remain within the Union but rejected the coercion of the southern states by the United States. That year, Governor Claiborne Fox Jackson's attempts to tip the states towards the Confederacy culminated at the Camp Jackson Affair on May the 10th, 1861. Volunteer Union Army regiments under Brigadier General Nathaniel Lyon captured 669 secessionist state militia members at Camp Jackson after learning the militia was planning to raid the federal arsenal in St. Louis. While marching the captives through town, a hostile crowd gathered. After an initial gunshot, Lyon's men fired into the mob, killing at least 28 civilians and injuring dozens of others. Several days of rioting throughout St. Louis followed. The violence ended only after martial law was imposed. Governor Jackson abandoned the capital before Brigadier General Lyon and Union forces occupied Jefferson City on June 13, 1861. The Missouri State Convention adopted an ordinance that the offices of Governor, Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, and the General Assembly were vacant on July 31, 1861. The goal of this move was to oust the pro-Confederate members with new elections to be held in November. In response, Governor Jackson issued a proclamation on August the 5th declaring Missouri a free republic, dissolving ties with the Union. As a result, this border state between the divided United States was essentially divided itself into one Missouri that supported the Union and another that was leaving the Union. Missouri became the site of fierce military operations, with regular troops from the North fighting Confederate soldiers as well as militias using guerrilla warfare. In the end, the Civil War would not only be the deadliest war to be fought on U.S. soil, but for Americans, it's the deadliest war to date overall, rivaling the total U.S. casualties from both World Wars, the Vietnam War, and the Korean War combined. Josie Wales was born in Missouri to a family of Scottish and Welsh descent and became a farmer along the Kansas border, settling down with his wife and his young son, Josie Jr. Maybe he was out of concern for protecting his family and taking care of his own farm, but for his own reasons, he decided to stay out of the fight and stay home. That was all about to change. One afternoon, a band of Unionist redlegs commanded by Captain Bill Terrell rode into Wales' farm. The men composing this company out of Kansas became known as Red Legs from the fact they wore leggings of red or red-colored leather. Wales was in the field as he worked his plow. At the sound of screams and the sign of smoke, he raced back to his home. He found his wife being dragged out of a burning house by the Union Red Legs, and his son, trapped inside the burning building, called for help. But before Wales could intercede, Terrell slashed Wales across the face with a sword, knocking Wales unconscious. When Wales woke up, he found that his farm had been burned down and his wife and son with it. Josie had to do what no man should ever be forced to do. He buried his young wife and child, building makeshift crosses to mark their grave sites. Injured, exhausted, and having lost his family and his livelihood, Josie collapses. And there he laid in the dirt and waited. Maybe he waited for death. Maybe he waited for his chance for revenge. Given the situation, when a man faces this choice, it's not shameful or cowardly to choose death. You get to be with your loved ones and leave this hideous and cruel existence behind. Laying there in the mud and the ashes of his life, Josie closed his eyes and made his decision.
he picked up his old pistol out of the ashes and started practicing. He chose revenge. This is the story of the outlaw Josie Wales. Man, he's got to do something for a living these days. Diane ain't much of a living, boy. On this channel, I create commentary and review videos about movies from a time when movies were actually good. Movies that maybe you grew up with. Since this is such a small channel, I probably won't be popping up much in your suggestions, so if you would like to take a trip down memory lane and see more of my content in the future, I would greatly appreciate you clicking that subscribe and thumbs up button. It really helps these videos reach more people like you who want to see this sort of content. Thanks for listening to my speech. Let's begin the video. Thank you. <gasps> Josie would soon get all the practice he needed to hone his skills and become a trained killer of men. Eventually, a band of Southern militia members pursuing the Union Redlegs arrived at the ruins of Josie Wales Farm. Having similar goals, he joined the Renegades and rode off for vengeance. We're going up there and set things all right. I'll be coming with you. In the following series of fights, Josie Wales grew his skills as a gunslinger while his gang raided Union Camp after Union Camp. He developed a reputation for his guile and his skills as a killer. In the end, however, the Southern militias would not prevail. Facing growing numbers of equipped Union troops and diminishing supply lines, more and more of the rebelling bushwhackers were unable to keep up the fight. Sensing the advantage, the Union started offering amnesty deals, allowing the rebels to lay down their arms and surrender peacefully. They even dangled Northern Senator Jim Lane perhaps as a sign of their credibility and benevolent intention. But right away, you could tell that this offer of amnesty and peace was all a lie. After a long series of raids, dwindling supplies, and weighted down by the fatigue from being on the run day and night, the rebel group that Wales was a member of decided to take the Union up on their offer and surrender. All except one. Josie Wales was not done fighting yet. They said their goodbyes, and rode into the Union camp to end their fight. Just as they found him, Josie was alone, sitting in the dirt, waiting for his next opportunity to gun down some red legs. He didn't have to wait long. It turns out that the Union soldiers that his friends were approaching were being led by none other than Captain Bill Terrell. The same Bill Terrell that burned down and murdered Josie Wales' family. He was a real snake, one of those killers dressed as a soldier type of person who takes joy in killing. A monster without code or virtue. Without their knowledge, the rebels have entered a Union trap. Permitus, Lion, Missouris, go! Josie Wales tries to save them, but he's too late once again. Only two men survive the trap. John Fletcher, his former rebel leader, and Jamie Bottoms, a scared, yet still idealistic kid that Josie had bonded with. He was mortally wounded and represents the last tie Josie Wales had to the war and any hope of returning to a normal life. Fletcher, sensing that he must fully turn to the Union lest he suffers the same fate as his comrades, joins the soldiers now tasked with hunting down Josie Wales. Fletcher tells the Union who they're up against. Captain Bill Terrell, who has been in the field, already knew. Those who challenge Josie Wales face an almost certain death. Across the faces of the Union officers, there were two reactions. One of suspicion at this tale of a mythical gunslinger, and one of fear from those who know damn well that the warning about Josie Wales is true. The stage was set, at least in the minds of the Union. Though Josie Wales may have been better with the gun, they'd use their superior numbers the aid of his former leader, John Fletcher, and the intimidation of the Union banner to hunt down a single rider and a wounded passenger. Surely, this would be enough to get the job done and kill Josie Wales. I suppose on paper they may have been right. For a time there, Josie carrying a wounded Jamie Bottoms used their rebel tactics to stay one step ahead of the pursuing soldiers. Eventually, his young friend dies, and it marks a time for Josie to change his tactics. 
Maybe he learned a lesson of how, without support, even his skilled band of rebel fighters eventually had to lay down their guns. He enters Indian lands, where he finds and eventually teams up with an old native named Lone Wadi and a young native girl named Little Moonlight. What this meant was that Josie Wales was changing his tactics to give him a better chance of staying alive and beating those red legs who were chasing him. They expected him to be traveling alone, getting by on his wits and his grit. What they did not expect was Josie Wales to form a new group, a group of people who wouldn't normally be considered gunfighters. It became clear that Lone Wadi and Moonlight were capable of defending themselves and became assets to Josie Wales' new team. As they headed south towards Mexico, the trio entered Comanche territory, where their skills to defend themselves would be tested. They encounter a gang of Comancheros, a pack of raiders who attacked travelers and seized any items or people they thought would be of value to the feared leader of the area, a Comanche named Ten Bears. Josie Wales was able to rescue not only Lone Wadi, who had been captured trying to spy on the Comancheros, but also an old lady named Sarah Turner and another young girl named Laura Lee. Their caravan had been attacked and they were the only two survivors. Sarah tells them of a town they can head towards named Santa Rio, a wonderful place whose main trade came from a silver mine in the area. The gang of now five members head further south towards Santo Rio. Once they arrive, they find out the truth. The mine has dried up, and the town soon thereafter. All that was left was a handful of people who used to benefit from that silver mine, but had stayed behind after it was finished. Sarah Turner sees this town as a place to settle down and make a new home. My guess is Josie Whale saw this as a place he could leave them behind and head into Mexico alone. They find an abandoned home and start outfitting it for battle, because one's coming. Knowing that they were still in Ten Bears territory, Josie Wales heads off to eliminate that threat, one way or the other. Josie Wales must have known that this little gang of his probably could take on the Red Legs, but not the massive force of Ten Bears' tribe, and definitely not both. Josie prepared for battle, and his likely death, just to give his followers and the remaining people of Santo Rio a chance to survive. Upon meeting him, Josie finds out that Ten Bears is very hostile to Union troops and the U.S. government for what they're doing to his people. Instead of immediately fighting, they both discover they have a common enemy. Josie Wales pledges that his group of followers and the people of Santo Rio are not a part of the United States' attacks on his people and would leave them alone if Ten Bears would do likewise. They seal their deal with a blood oath, leaving just the red legs to deal with. Soon thereafter, the Union finds their new home, and Josie Wales, with the support of his gang of civilians, successfully fend them off giving Josie the chance to get what he has wanted the entire time. Revenge. Josie confronts Captain Bill Terrell, the man who led the slaughter of his family, the man who chased him through several states, and the man who made Josie Wales into an outlaw. Josie Whale stabs Bill Terrell through the torso, using Terrell's own sword. And then it's done. Josie has a few last words with his former leader and former friend, John Fletcher, and then rides into a sunset-lit valley and freedom. Over the course of this story, I've avoided calling Josie Wales an outlaw. He was a farmer and a family man until the events that took his home, his livelihood, and his family. He was only an outlaw to those Union soldiers who hunted him for his revenge. The Outlaw Josie Wales movie was released in 1976 and was one of the films that marked the end of the great cinematic western. This might surprise you, but this is not my favorite western, nor is it my favorite Clint Eastwood movie. I think we can all agree that the best Clint Eastwood movie is... That's right. 1978's Every Which Way But Loose. Now I'm not saying this movie's bad. I think Outlaw Josie Wales is great. It's still one of my favorites. It was very successful in the box office and very positively reviewed. Even though Josie Wales is in no way connected to the characters Eastwood played previously, this movie almost feels like a continuation of what we've seen before. A younger Eastwood played almost a mythical creature in other films. Death Incarnate, The Man With No Name, 
getting by on his wits and his talent with the pistol. In the outlaw Josie Wales, we see a different side. He remains a skilled gunfighter. He's still as tough as any of his other characters, but now we see him reaching out to others a little bit more, taking care of those followers that depend on him, and safely getting them to their sanctuary before riding off into the sunset. Why do we see this change in Josie Wales? Maybe he's getting a little bit older. Maybe he needed the help from others. Maybe he was more impacted by the loss of his family, or even the loss of his young friend Jamie Bottoms than he let on. But in the end, the days of the Sergio Leone Spaghetti Westerns are over, and it was time for the lone spectral gunslinger to move on. I have one final theory as to why Josie Wales not only bonded with this ragtag group of people he encountered, but also why this movie stands out as one of the top westerns of all time. Bear with me a little bit. As a movie, one of the outlaw Josie Wales strengths is in his portrayal of the horrors that the border states faced during the Civil War. Over time, history has polished and sanitized the events of this era, giving us a much more comfortable, if not inaccurate, view of what life was like back then. Even though the title of Outlaw was pinned on Josie Wales, in the movie, it's the US government via the Union Redlegs that are portrayed as the real outlaws. Attacks on civilians, treaties under false pretenses, the slaughter of captured and unarmed soldiers, oppression of the Indians, all of these are terrible crimes. None of them committed by Josie Wales, but by the Union. After all that happened to Josie Wales, I believe he bonded with these people he met because, in different ways, they were all screwed over by the actions of the U.S. government. Even his encounter with Ten Bears, one of the best scenes in the movie that did not include a gunfight, is based on the premise that both of them are suffering because of the consequences of war and the violence caused by the Union. It is clear that Ten Bears hated the Union, and initially, he's willing to let Josie Wells go in peace because he knows Josie's fighting the Union. When Josie proposes that the Comanche and the people in his settlement live in peace, it is the word of iron, the word of two killers, that allows this deal to be made. No false treaties, no deceptive contracts, just the word of two men and blood. In the end, Josie Wales is a hero, the protagonist in literary terms. He gets revenge for his family. He fights against what his people considered invaders from the north. He gives an old Indian chief another lease on life. He saves a young Indian girl from slavery and rape. He saves an old lady and young girl from a similar fate, and even negotiates peace with Comanches. Not too bad of a job for someone called Outlaw. As I mentioned earlier, the Union and the U.S. government are clearly the villains in this movie. So their pursuit of Josie Wales, their brutality with people in the path of their pursuit, and even labeling Josie Wales as an outlaw, are based on their own evil deeds, and therefore can be considered malevolent. As said early on in the movie, to the victor goes the spoils, and so does history. History, as it is reimagined for the victor's political purposes, would undoubtedly cast a negative light on Josie Wales solely because he happened to fight for the losing side. Could you imagine how this story would be told today? Josie Wales would be a brutal killer of innocent soldiers, women, and children as he went on a multi-state murder spree in an attempt to evade authorities. In the movie, the granny, once she finds out that Josie Wales is from Missouri, says that everyone from Missouri is a killer. Lone Wadey tells her that given the choice of riding with Josie Wales or surrendering to essentially any other party in this story, he would, without a doubt, choose to ride with Josie Wales. Granny agrees, as do I. Given a similar situation and given the same choices, I'd ride with him. I'd ride with the hero, Josie Wales. As I mentioned at the start of this video, I'd like to grow this audience. My next milestone is the big 1,000 subscribers. If you enjoyed this video or any of my other videos, please like and subscribe to continue seeing videos like this and what I have coming out in the future. Thank you for watching. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son.